So fight focus with the most embarrassing moments in the UFC. So yeah, we about to hop straight into this video. So let's get it. Welcome back to Fight Focus. And for today's video, we will be covering the UFC's most embarrassing moments. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and comment what video you want to see next. Let's get to it. Just like any other sport, MMA has its awkward moments. The athletic ability required to be a mixed martial artist is immense. However, linguistic skills are not mandatory, and that is an area in which many fighters are severely lacking. The embarrassing scenarios can arise in many more places than just post-fight interviews, as you will find out. Let's get started, shall we? First up, we have Justine Kish. In the midst of fighting off a choke by Felice Herrig at UFC Fight Night 112, disaster struck for Justine as she kind of, um, let it go, leaving easily visible brown stains on the octagon mat. Believe it or not, neither fighter seemed to take notice at the time, and the fight continued to a decision, at which point Kish looked down in horror at the mat. When she wanted to flee for the nearest exit, out of sportsmanship, Kish stayed on until after the decision was announced, which she said felt like an eternity, given her predicament, before finally leaving the octagon. However, despite her nightmare situation, Kish showed a sense of humor afterwards on social media and said, I'm a warrior and I'll never quit. Shit happens. Haha, be back soon. Next up, Dennis Hallman. When Dennis Hallman stepped in the octagon Ooh, at UFC what? 133 wearing a disturbingly small blue Speedos, it wasn't the result of a fashion choice on UFC fighters' behalf. Hallman told Ariel Hawani afterwards that he lost a bet and losing the bet meant they Man, had to go his ear, Speedos. his cartilage off. As embarrassing as it was for Hallman, it also left him able to only fit two sponsors on the small amount of fabric on the Speedos, costing him a lot of money. However, it got even worse for Hallman when during the fight he suffered a wardrobe malfunction in the midst of a grappling exchange that led to his balls being exposed on live TV. To add to his woes, Dana White was fuming about Holman's attire, stating afterwards that he was horrified and disgusted. By the side of the Speedos and banned everybody from the following suit in the future. He also revealed that he had given Brian Ebersole $70,000 to thank for getting the shorts off the hell off TV bonus. After he completed Holman's humiliation by KOing him later in the first round. Next so basically he just likes attention. That's all that is. He just likes attention. Yeah, Rizumar Paul. Like what was the Speedo supposed to do in fighting? Lars. After handing Dan Miller a vicious ground and pound beatdown at UFC 134, yeah. Ruzumar Polares got up and celebrated his victory with ferocious intensity, raising his hands aloft and then jumping up onto the octagon cage to roar out the crown triumph. There's only one problem. At no point had referee Herb Dean given any indication the fight was actually over. With Miller now on his feet ready to continue, Polaris seemed bemused, but had to get back to the business at hand. With the fight he resuming, got his ass being, he was by no means done as he dropped Aquino soon afterwards, before ultimately losing out by decision. Dana White said that is fucking crazy. I never seen anything like this before. Dana White remarked afterwards in no way, shape, or form did Herb Dean stop that fight or even come close. He didn't even make a move toward them to stop that fight. Next up, Charles Oliveira. Mm. Charles Oliveira has a unique way of dealing with getting hit in the groin. It's always that unfortunate and difficult thing to watch when a fighter gets Jesus, hit in the groin. Jesus. It just makes you win, so you don't really like to see it. It's not unusual for a fighter to jump around a bit and do a little bit of rubbing after being struck with a low blow. However, it is rather unusual for a fighter to stick their hands down their pants after suffering a low blow as many of the fans watched Charles doing this. We probably didn't really need to see that Charles, but we did anyway. It was the most embarrassing moment not only for Charles, but also for the fans. Probably a lot of them were laughing after seeing this on live TV. And what happened next was even more embarrassing, with that same hand without even washing. I doubt Esquerdo was pleased with the idea of being punched by a hand that was just in someone's shorts. Next up, <laughs> Chuck Liddell. In his UFC, like, no, we Chuck can't Liddell continue. Took full the advantage fight. of being one of the biggest sports stars and was known to party like a rock star. However, that appeared to catch up with him during an infamously cringeworthy interview on the Good Morning Texas show back in 2007 when Liddell was so incoherent that people immediately began to suspect he might be either taking drugs or drunk. The show's Ooh. host began to show concern for how Liddell was acting, asking him if he was okay at one stage as he repeatedly mumbled and slurred his words and even appeared to momentarily fall asleep at one point. The appearance was hugely embarrassing for Liddell, who claimed later he'd overtaken sleep medication. And the UFC, who pulled him for all his other scheduled promotional oh, interviews to avoid oh, any more PR oh, disasters. Oh. Next up, Gray Maynard. Jeez. Getting a knockout <laughs> via a powerful slam is something that any fighter would love to have on the highlight reel. And Gray Maynard did just that when he hoisted Rob Emerson into the air and brought him back down to earth with a thump at the Ultimate Fighter 5 finale, rendering him unconscious. There was a catch though. In the process, Maynard managed to knock himself out too as he face played onto the mat. To make matters worse, Maynard apparently didn't realize what had happened and reacted furiously with a no contest ruling was declared afterwards, insisting he was an out. That led to Joe Rogan making him watch footage of his embarrassing blunder on the arena big screen multiple times during his post-fight interview to prove that he was in fact KO'd. 
Despite his denials, the replay clearly showed Maynard was in a day stupor after the slam, eventually rolling yeah. off Emerson and laying with his eyes rolling back up into his head, before he then woozily tried to get to his knees and fell back onto the mat when he attempted to stand. Next up, Caleb Starnes. Of all the fights that have taken place in the octagon, there's never been one more embarrassing than the time that, that Starnes decided to continuously backpedal around the edge of the octagon for 15 minutes against Nate Quarry. The fight left Quarry so bemused that he began hamming it up, pretending to run after Starnes and doing robotic attacks. Much to the amusement of the equally perplexed fans watching his opponent effectively commit career suicide in the cage. Starnes, who mustered a total of 12 strikes during the whole fight, was fired from the UFC afterwards and became a figure of ridicule for fans, who nicknamed him The Running Man. White said he just doesn't belong in the UFC, and after his performance the other night, he should consider a new line of work. Next up, Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva's confidence was running high when he stepped in the octagon to fight Chris Weidman for the first time in UFC 162 in 2013. After all that time, he was long reigning middleweight champion with no less than 10 successful title defenses. Had never been beaten, the UFC was considered by some to be the greatest mixed martial artist of all time. The longer his reign lasted, the more confident and some might even say cocky the Brazilian legend became. And that had produced some priceless moments in the octagon where he would drop his hands, let his opponents take free swings at him, yeah. and somehow still managed to avoid the incoming punches leading Joe Rogan to exclaim on one occasion that Silva was moving inside the Matrix. However, if you live up by the sword, you die by the sword. And when Chris Weidman went up against him, he showed no respect for Silva's showboating antics. As such, when Silva dropped his hand, stuck out his chin, and mocked the attempts to hit him, he didn't pretend to be hurt in a comical fashion. He just kept on punching until he did finally manage to connect clean to the champion's chin, knocking him out cold in humiliating fashion. Wow. Next up, Max Holloway. UFC featherweight champion Max Holloway had a challenging weight cut prior to UFC 218 last year that left him to strip down to his birthday suit in order to make the featherweight limit. Standing in front of the assembled media, towels were brought out to protect Blessed's modesty as he stood onto the scale. But things didn't go quite according to plan. Unfortunately for Holloway, one of the two men holding the towel from, <laughs> fellow fighter Justin Gaethje, decided to flip the towel as he stood there, which mistakenly resulted in his man parts being left exposed to the waiting cameras. Holloway quickly covered up and Justin laughed off his blunder. But later, Blessed accidentally also exposed his bare butt as he tried to put his shorts back on again. Next up, David Kaplan. Dave Kaplan asks Tom Lauder to punch him and gets knocked out. Some men just don't know their limits. After excessively bragging about how he couldn't be knocked out, Dave Kaplan begs the Ultimate Fighter teammate Tom Lawler to punch him in the face. Lawler on the other so hand stupid. took it really awkward at the start, but then thought that no one could ever get a chance to hit both the rival and his bragging at the same time. Tom, who fights three weight classes above Dave, reluctantly agreed and then punched Kaplan mm. completely unconscious. It was something that Dave wasn't expecting, so brutal and hard. Probably he thought he would dodge the punch but ended opposite. It was a pretty funny thing to watch for the viewers at home, but no doubt it was an uncomfortable experience for Lawler. The funniest part was after regaining consciousness, Dave tried to say that he didn't get knocked out but it was too late, mate. Next up, Gina Carano. This isn't a case of a fighter doing anything awkward, but is subject to an embarrassing interview in the form of Wei Ting. Apart from being generally unprofessional reading questions off his Blackberry, Ting also makes his interview very embarrassing and uncomfortable by asking a series of inappropriate questions. Here's some samples of Wei's journalistic dynamite. Do you get hit on more or less now that you're famous? Do you wear makeup when you fight? Who do you think is the ugliest MMA fighter? Carano does her best to stay composed and answer the questions carefully, but it doesn't stop the interview from being more uncomfortable to watch. Also, the interview is extremely detrimental to the growth of women's MMA, given that all the right. questions center around gender and appearance. Right. Hey, I was just thinking that. Like, would you ask a male MMA fighter these dumbass questions? Like, oh, because she a female, we gonna talk about fashion and makeup and hair. And no, like, take me Someone serious. Unfamiliar with women's MMA to take it seriously if they were to see only this interview. Next up, Bill Superfoot Wallace. At the first ever event, all the way back in 1993, former kickboxing star Bill Superfoot Wallace served as the lead commentator and delivered some of the most cringe-inducing moments in sports casting history. From start to finish, Wallace's commentary could qualify as one long embarrassing moment in which he repeatedly showed his ability to put his superfoot in his mouth, but none more so than during his opening monologue. In the space of just a few seconds, Wallace managed to get the UFC's name wrong twice, calling it the Ultimate Fighting Challenge instead of Ultimate Fighting Championship and burped in the middle of saying the name, saying the name of the arena the event was taking place in. As the event went on, Wallace would go and pronounce virtually everybody's name wrong, including Royce Gracie, Roy, interpretations of Gerard Gordeau, and Taylor Tooley's names, while he even bungled the names of his own broadcasting reporters, including failing to ever correctly call Rich Goins by his name, of opting new with Rod, and Ron instead. He also invented new words like this combobberates, and gave fascinating insights such as pain hurts, and that the fights were taking place in an octagonal octagon. Next up, Damian Maya. Damian Maya kisses Nate Corey. This is just a case of an unfortunate timing. Nate Corey and Damian Maya hug after their fight in a mutual show of respect. But they came. What happened is Maya intends to kiss Corey on the cheek, but just as he's doing that, Corey turns his head and boom. It was not that type of kiss, but an activity that can be called as a kiss. 
The end result is two men kissing on the lips, and Nate quickly walks away, seemingly embarrassed by this act. All right, MMA fans, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this Why video. Why are we kissing? If you enjoyed this video, please give oh it a like. Oh my god, is that Make a broken sure foot? Notification bell. <laughs> Why are we kissing our opponent? That's just weird. Like, keep your lips to yourself. I don't know where your lips have been. That's just weird. Some of these MMA fighters are weird as fuck. Like, I don't know. They just do weird shit. But yeah, y'all, that was my reaction to this video. If you guys enjoyed my reaction, please make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see y'all in my next reaction video.